tell me. What do you see? A drug dealer or a thug? An absentee father, maybe? Or a predator? How do you feel? Scared? Threatened? The need to distance yourself from the person you see before you? I see potential, limitless potential. My name is Dylan Brown, I'm 16 years old, and I'm young, black, and male. You know, last time I checked, those words didn't mean to shoot to kill, to be suspicious of someone wearing a hoodie and sweatpants, to make judgments about a person's character and values, or feel the need to walk to the other side of the street in fear. No, that's not what those words mean at all then why is it that's how American society treats young men of color? I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, widely known across the country for being an inclusive and progressive community. However, I'm here to tell you, racism knows no boundaries. It is not confined to a specific area or region, it is pervasive and affects us all. Let me tell you a story, my story. If you were to sum up all my life experiences, it would be embodied by this one phrase. Dylan, you're smart for a black guy. You're smart for a black guy. Thank you? This is a phrase I've heard more times than I would care to admit throughout my life. This subtle compliment, if you can even call it that, has been used to oppress generations of young, promising African-American men, not unlike myself. This denigrating comment serves as a reminder. No matter what I might achieve, no matter how successful I become, I will only be a success for a black man. I'm not just smart. No, I have to be put in my place. I'm smart for a black man. I'm automatically placed in a box that confines my achievements and defines the finish line before the race has even begun. Growing up, one of the assignments I had in school was to create a poster that answered the age-old question, Dylan, what do you want to be when you grow up? I remember sitting at my desk thinking of all the possibilities. I could be a doctor, I could be a lawyer, I could be anything. I really like school, so I'll go to college and I'll have all these opportunities available to me. I was so excited, I took out my crayons and thought, I'm gonna have the best poster. And then I had a realization. How do I draw this? What does it look like? I remember thinking, black men in film, media, and TV are hardly ever portrayed as being successful, let alone college educated. So how can I hope to be a successful individual when the main message the media delivers to me is that black men are built up only to be shot down? Why? 75% of the people local news stations broadcast as responsible for crimes such as murder, theft, and assault are black. Even though this isn't an accurate representation, it creates a bias where unconsciously people begin to treat black people as if the stereotypes they read about, they hear about, are true. So it begs the question, am I just a stereotype? Does that mean I can't be a doctor or a lawyer because that's not what society says black people are supposed to do? This was a struggle I continued to grapple with throughout my childhood. However, it reached its apex on February 26, 2012, the day Trayvon Benjamin Martin was fatally shot. The day Trayvon was shot was a turning point in my life. It was the beginning of a period that still rages on today. It was the beginning of the time when I could turn on the TV, go on my phone, go on the internet, and find another news article or picture of another young black man that looked just like me, that could be me, had been gunned to the ground. I'll never forget what transpired following the shooting of Trayvon Martin. An event that happened over a thousand miles away from me had real world implications just two miles from where I live. It was late in the evening, and I, was going, I went to the local grocery store with my mom. It was a place my family had frequented often. It had been a long day, so I didn't think much of it when I hopped in the car with my mom in a hoodie and sweatpants. Once in the store, I separated from my mom. 
I wandered up and down an aisle while my mom was in another. Then suddenly, the store owner came up to me and he said, you look suspicious. Are you stealing? I remember thinking, suspicious? Such an objective word. Was it the fact that I had been named and commended to the honor roll that made me look suspicious? No, that wasn't it. It must have been my award for outstanding moral character. All that store owner saw was the color of my skin. He saw a young black guy in a hoodie and sweatpants and assumed he must be a thief. He couldn't possibly be anything else. Someone recently asked me, what would you do if you saw that store owner again? And I remember in that moment, I was so enraged. I felt like everything I'd worked for in my life, everything that I had achieved, had been wiped out with a hoodie. But I'm here to say, my hoodie does not define me. It does not make me a thief. It took me a minute to answer his question, but then I said, I would tell that store owner, thank you. I would say thank you. My experience with that store owner opened me up to the experience every youth of color in this country will be forced to have. The experience of having someone judge who you are, how you will act, before you've even spoken one word. The fact that I'm young, black, and male is enough for some people to decide my life doesn't matter, that I'm expendable. After all, it certainly was enough for George Zimmerman to decide Trayvon Martin's life doesn't matter. Or how about Oscar Grant, Michael Brown, James Byrd Jr., even 12-year-old Tamir Rice? Or instances like the deaths of Matthew Shepard and Brendan Tenner? Or any other of the countless Americans who have faced prejudice and been discriminated against for how society perceived them to be? I wake up every morning knowing I have to be conscious of the image I present to the world. Going out in a hoodie and sweatpants at the wrong place at the wrong time could get me killed. Will I be shot on BART one day like Oscar Grant? Martin Luther King delivered a speech following the march from Selma to Montgomery on the steps of the Alabama State Capitol. It later became popularly known as his how long, not long speech. So I'm here to ask you, 51 years later after that speech was given, how much longer? How many more people have to die? Do I have to die? How much longer? American culture has become synonymous with racism. Using racial slurs like for a black man creates a culture of inferiority that tells the world my life doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is that one out of every three black men between the ages of 18 and 30 is in jail, in prison, on probation, or on parole. We live in a world where there are more black men in prison, in jail, on probation, or on parole than were enslaved in 1850 before the Civil War began. I'm here to tell you, I refuse to be yet another nameless black man that has been gunned down. I leave you with this. Do not let the numerous injustices you see in our world scare you into an action. Do not let fear overwhelm you. Everyone in this room has the power to make a change. Use the one thing we all have. Speak out, change the conversation. Because whether you believe it or not, what you have to say could change the world.